Hey, I'm Reverend Jenny Williams. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the co-chairs of Justice and Jubilee. Thank you so much for being with us this week. Justice and Jubilee is a movement for collective liberation rooted in progressive Christianity and born in West Virginia. Last week on the video, I talked about four virtues that we honor in our work, curiosity, humility, vulnerability, and authenticity. These form the posture that we take in pursuing the dignity and flourishing of all people. Virtues aren't the whole story though. They are a way of being that we have to work on and cultivate. But liberation work and following the call of the prophets and Jesus requires not just being, but doing. And of course the two are intertwined. So today I'm gonna to talk about four practices that we honor and cultivate in this movement. While I'm gonna be sharing with you on this video, uh, this is an ongoing conversation. So I invite you to offer your own comments uh, in the comments below the video um, of practices that you think should be lifted up and other places in scripture that support the practices I talk about um, or other passages that we should think of. Before I launch into talking about the first practice, I'll say that I'm recording from home and uh, you might see my dog Stella walking around the outside and you might hear a little clicking and clacking or meowing in the background. That is my cat furiously trying to get into this room. This is probably the 20th take of this uh, to try to minimize cat noise and so she's just going to keep making noise, but it's better than having her walk around regularly. So, um, you know, just keep mouse my cat in your thoughts as she is unable to join us and would very much like to. So the primary practice that we are all about is the practice of solidarity being in solidarity with people who are different from ourselves, and particularly being in solidarity with people who have been historically excluded and marginalized by society and by the church. Now, a little note that I wanna offer right here at the beginning of talking about solidarity is that um, we tend to say things like, um, stand in solidarity with people. That's been kind of a historic strong way of expressing the desire to be in relationship with people who are different from ourselves or who struggle. That's ableist language, right, when we use the language of stand. So I want to encourage you as you think about solidarity and practice it to think about other ways of expressing that. So one might be um, be in solidarity with others. Now that's, uh, that's uh, maybe not a verb, that's a uh, strong. So you can say something like engage in solidarity or practice solidarity in action. But I just wanted to flag that language so that we were mindful and can be in solidar solidarity with our disabled friends. So one of the things that you probably know if you've been involved in churches is that churches are really good at practices of charity. Right? Churches are really good at meeting material needs of people. It's some of the most enthusiastically supported ministry and programs in local congregations uh, that churches undertake. One of the things that we want to do in this movement is grow as people of faith beyond charity to solidarity. Now, let me give you an example of a well-intended charity. It's a church group full of great people who went to a local mission that serves people who are unhoused. And this mission often had opportunities for churches and other groups to bring lunch in uh, for the folks who spent time there during the day and also spent time there at night. So this group was bringing lunch and the group uh, really wanted to provide a nice meal for the folks who were attending and thought, you know, they probably get the same old thing over and over again. And so they added uh, what they thought were some niceties to the meal. One example is vinaigrette dressing. They brought vinaigrette dressing because they thought that would be a little special flair that maybe the folks who were eating uh, salad time after time wouldn't get. Once you know it, the people who came through the line as they got their food repeatedly asked, where's the ranch dressing? And the group was kind of mystified by that and asked the director after lunch what was going on. The director said, ranch, black coffee, lots of salt, and lots of pepper. Those are the preferences at these meals. The church members would have known if they had spent time with the folks that they went to serve, that these were the preferences. But, and I'll say, I was part of this group. We didn't really go to serve, we went to help. 
and that's different. Service and solidarity rely on relationships, not transactional relationships where we're trying to get to know someone so we can understand their needs, but true peer relationships where we care about each other as people. A friend of mine once phrased this as um, solidarity in um, Christian life is when we don't see our neighbors as projects, but as friends. In case you couldn't hear that over my cat, I'll say it again. So Christian solidarity is when we don't see our neighbors as projects, but as friends. One of the things that entails is that people of privilege um, try to seek out spaces where uh, folks who've been marginalized are gathering and asking if it's okay if we sit in those spaces. This is exercising that humility that I discussed last week because those spaces won't be open to people of privilege sometimes and people of privilege need to respect that. So I'll give you two examples. One is an example that I once heard a, a black woman on a panel speak. She's a tremendous organizer who at that time was organizing in West Virginia. Her name is Jennifer Wells. And uh, this was sort of one of those panels um, where someone in the panel said, can you give us you know, uh, tips to fight racism? Which is such a, a short-sighted white person question. Give us the easy fixes, right? And Jennifer got really frustrated um, and said, look, there aren't easy tips and fixes. And one thing that you have to do is stop asking black leaders to come lead your thing, to come into your spaces. What you have to do if you want to build relationships is go to where the black leaders are. Don't ask them to do extra work. I thought that was really insightful. It was said off the cuff. And it was really true. Another example is there was an unhoused um, camp encampment uh, not too far from where I live. And lots of people, especially lots of people in churches, were rallying around this encampment who had kind of banded together um, to be able to form community with each other and um, be able just to continue to exist by camping outside, folks who were unhoused. And uh, lots of church folks would go into the encampment to bring much needed materials, but then also sort of excitedly want to talk about the talk with the people who were living there. Can you imagine if somebody just came into your neighborhood or to your door and was like, let's sit down and talk um, without any invitation to do so or um, understanding that that person just kind of wanted to ask you question after question about what your life was like? That's a transactional relationship. That's not uh, pursuing solidarity. Solidarity is getting to know someone over a long period of time for who they are. And I'll talk a little bit about a practice that will mitigate against that being transactional. When we form relationships of solidarity, then action takes place within and because of those relationships. Action is the whole goal of our movement. What can we be doing in our communities and our states, in our states so that everyone has um, dignity and can flourish? We need to take our cues from leaders within communities of people who are marginalized. For example, that encampment in the town nearby, the folks who lived in that encampment didn't want a shelter. There was a lot of energy going into um, uh, brick and mortar uh, shelter for the folks in that encampment. And the folks in that encampment said, we have a community, like we're good doing this. What we really want is a piece of land and some porta potties and some trash service and stop having our encampment torn down by the city. Whereas people who thought they knew the answer thought that a brick and mortar space would be most helpful they weren't listening to the people who lived in that community. So something that we strive to do is take our cues for action from the communities uh, in which we are forming relationships. That action may be through systems that are already in place, systems of governance, but more importantly, I think our actions are going to be building alternative systems to the ones that already exist. So that's a little bit about the practice of solidarity. I'm going to talk about three more practices uh, in a much 
um, quicker version, but they're equally important. One is the practice of community. So in 1 Peter 2.10, um, the, the letter says, Once you were not a people, and now you are the people of God. We belong to a people, we who follow Jesus. That's not a solitary endeavor. That people of God formed as a covenant people with Abraham and Sarah, going on to the 12 tribes of Israel from Jacob and his partners. Those are the people of God called to be a blessing in the world. When Jesus came, Jesus didn't just talk to individual people. Jesus formed community, a community of disciples that had this inner circle of the 12 and a much wider outer circle of all people. We saw community form after Pentecost, particularly it's mentioned in Acts 2 and Acts 4, where communities formed and depended on one another. That was also the case for the epistles in, um, <clears throat> in the New Testament, where those letters were written to communities of faith. Now, we who call ourselves Christians, we're party crashers to the people of God. We are Gentiles that were grafted in to the people of God through the body of Jesus Christ. That's something important to remember, that the people of God existed long before us and will exist long after us. There's no Christianity in isolation. That's why this Justice and Jubilee work is so important. We are forming community in order to be able to pursue liberation in the world. This is collective work and we need each other for it. And if we practice, truly practice community, we will be intersectional and see that so many needs for liberation are bound up with each other. Christian community is a practice. It's a hard one for people who've been harmed by the church and something that we have to work at. But we believe that practicing community, that in practicing community, that the Holy Spirit is within those communal spaces, making us more than a sum of our parts, but making us a dwelling for God. Our next practice is the practice of mutuality, which comes within community. Again, the communities that we see in Acts 2 and 4, they were selling all their stuff and redistributing, redistributing the money um, and the goods so that everybody had what they needed. Those were practices of mutuality. And in the future, we'll talk about the practice of mutual aid, which isn't charity. It doesn't have the same dynamics. It's not transactional. Mutual aid is a practice where we believe that everybody who comes uh, to a gathering or is part of a group in a neighborhood or part of an online group has something to offer. It's not going to be the same thing. People aren't all going to be able to offer the same thing. But our gifts, our talents, our possessions, these are things that we can offer to support and help one another, to promote flourishing as we are in solidarity with each other. And finally, I just want to talk, touch on one last practice, and that's the practice of joy. Joy can involve humor, right? Jesus was really good at that. Jesus had a pretty dry sense of humor. So it can involve humor and laughter. It can involve love. And it can also involve pleasure, right? There's a, a wonderful book that I've been reading by Adrienne Marie Brown, who's a Black queer woman, called Pleasure Activism. All of her work is really good. But pleasure activism is based on the premise that if we don't believe that joy will come until liberation comes, then the oppressive systems already have us. Joy has to come throughout the work. And she says over and over again, prioritize pleasure. It's a wonderful book that talks about pleasure in our bodies, but we can derive pleasure from smelling a flower or, or um, we can derive pleasure from being with a friend. Uh, there are any number of ways that we practice joy. And to conclude that part, I just want to quote the poet Mary Oliver, who said, joy is not meant to be a crumb. We practice joy in this work, because if justice work isn't joyful, why would we want to do it? So those four practices, solidarity, community, mutuality, and joy, are a major part of what we seek to honor and cultivate in our movement work. 
Again, I invite you to add in the comments um, any examples that you might add from the Bible or Christian tradition uh, that we should uplift and honor. And also, I hope that in this next piece of music that you find the opportunity to reflect, to to think about which of these practices is something that you could work on and let us know how we can help you with that. <laughs>